Thank you very much, and welcome to the talk. All right, so let's get it started. So, has this ever happened to you? You are the President of the United States in the 1990s, and you have a top secret family recipe for your grandmother's apple pie. And you need to talk to your family about it because you've got some details, but there's a problem. Your phone lines might be tapped. And if that happens, if you talk about that over the phone, your family recipe, it's going to be out in the open, big problems in the family. So what do you do? So you get a secure telephone with encryption, high-grade encryption, and you make sure that when you call grandma or whoever you need to call, that you know all secure, nobody's going to find out about your recipe. But there's a, there's a little bit of a complication. In order to get the telephone to work, which is you know that big black unit at the bottom, you also need to have a key for the phone. And so this talk is not about the telephone itself, but about the key that goes into the phone. And more on that later. All right. So, <laughs> or I could do the whole talk with that on. <laughs> Uh, so, so what is what is the phone specifically? So, in the uh, in the 1980s, uh, the U.S. government wanted a uh, secure, uh, you know, communications for talking about defense type stuff. So, you know, if you're working on missiles or you know, talking to embassies, something like that, uh, you use something called the Secure Telephone Unit Generation Two or Stu Two uh, system. And uh, the unit right there is a Stu Two. It's this big clunky thing. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and then you attached, I don't know, something like four or five phones to this, and not very portable, uh, very expensive, and so it didn't really see as much use as they were hoping. You know, very select areas like the White House used it, uh, but not generally deployed. So they said, okay, what, what can we do about this? And they said, we want to make a third generation secure telephone unit, which we're going to call the low cost terminal, or LCT, because instead of being, you know, this giant monster of a mainframe, you know, it's just going to be a kind of a clunky desktop phone that you could just kind of pick it up, you know, uh, move it around and, you know, give, give everyone one of these if they wanted one. And so they called this the future secure voice system for the whole program. And one of the interesting things about this is they said, okay, we also would like it so that everyone who has one of these phones also has a literal encryption key that they stick into this phone and you turn it uh, you know, to activate the encryption. You know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of tactile feedback. You go to websites these days, encryption, so boring. Back in the day, you used to be like, <coughs> encryption. And uh, I, I really think we should, we should bring that back. So just a little side note. Uh, but anyways, so, so here's, here's after, you know, they went through several generations of, uh, you know, things. Uh, here's, a, here's examples of some of these so-called Stu-3 systems. Now, as a side note, uh, there's, uh, these are civilian devices. So there's, there's military versions and there's uh, civilian, civilian versions. Uh, the versions that I'm playing with are the civilian versions. So on the left is the, uh, it's called the Sectel 9600, which is made by Motorola. And then on the right is the AT&T 4100, of course, made by AT&T. Uh, and so that's so-called type 4 encryption, which is very kind of low grade, but anyways. So, one of the problems though is I was able to, um, well anyways, you got these phones and you also need the keys. So they actually made uh, quite a few different keys for these phones. Uh, the most common name you'll see is the so-called uh, KSD64A, but there's you know all these different permutations. And then you got these little colorful tags that would, they would uh, stick on these things that would also indicate you know the function. You know whether it is a uh, you know custodian key is kind of like an administrator key. Uh, SAK is like um, uh, for for if you had a new area and you wanted to. Uh, uh, activate a phone. Anyways, the, the really dumb civilian ones, though, don't really use all these specialties there. They just basically use one encryption key. Uh, and then the second part of this is, if you have this funky key, you also need something called a keyceptacle to put the key into. And so, yeah, they've got, they've got this whole terminology ecosystem here. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so that's what it kind of disassembled. It's got some uh, switches on the back when it turns it, so you know if a, if a key is inserted. And then basically just a, a bunch of spring-loaded contacts uh, to keep the key in place. So, uh, problem. I was able to uh, borrow one of these telephones from someone. Uh, but unfortunately, the keys were very hard to come by. And uh, I basically was able to find one of these kind of broken keys on eBay, uh, but that was about it. So the question was, uh, how can I actually play with this phone if, if I don't have all the hardware I need uh, to play with the phone? So I said, could I make my own key for this thing? You know, there's a little bit of information out there. I kind of had a semi-working, kind of broken key. Could I piece everything together to, to make this work? And uh, so they said, okay, 
uh, I'm going to start off by um, seeing if I could make something that just mechanically fits into these uh, readers. And so I took some uh, calipers and, and made a little CAD drawing. And uh, I was also able to borrow a, a uh, working key from someone else for, for part of this project. And then you can see uh, on the right there is my reproduction uh, next to one of the actual keys. And you can see they're, they're fairly close. And uh, just for reference here, uh, these are kind of similar. I don't know if I can juggle with both hands, but uh, you see here's one of the reproductions here, and then here's one of the other models. So, so fairly close in appearance and seems to fit if you put it into the actual readers. And I said, okay, well that's cool, but now I gotta figure out the electrical part. And one of the issues with this is, is since these keys are so rare, uh, it was basically out of the question to open one of these things up and you know, destructively analyze it. So the question is, how can we go about analyzing this without opening it up? And a uh, few things. Uh, the first thing it turned out was that because that there was some military usage of these parts, uh, it actually has a national stock number. And as part of having a national stock number, there actually was a lot of information out there. Um, oh, and I should also mention, this, this system is like way obsolete. Uh, it's like several generations of, of phones have, have obsoleted it. But despite all of this, uh, there's, still, there's still a lot of information out there. And uh, so a, v a few very interesting things on here. One of them is this part number FSVS370. You know, it's Future Secure Voice System. That name kind of got uh, discontinued. But uh, we still see that there are also two memory chip parts, one by Advanced Micro Devices, better known as AMD, and another one called Zycor. So the 2864 turns out to be a parallel EEPROM. So that's pretty cool because this kind of lines up with the number of pins we have. And uh, if it was made sanely, the pins would just go from the chip uh, to, the, to the outside of the key. Well, good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is they aren't straight connections, or at least not for all of it. But the good news is there was this, there's a website called Crypto Museum, and Crypto Museum actually published x-rays for some of these keys. So I was able to uh, take uh, what I knew about the key uh, from you know, the, the data sheets from these uh, chips, make a guess, and then compare it to the x-rays and say, okay, you know, power goes here, ground goes here, and if we kind of follow it around the pad frame for the chip, where, sh where should all the connections go? And then uh, check that against the x-ray and then make a few tweaks where I, or I think they did some weird pin swapping stuff. And then, so the next part of that was I said, okay, this probably works, uh, but I would like to uh, see if I could verify it. And it turns out that while I wasn't able to really get a lot of these uh, phones to play with, I was able to get this thing called a PKS703. And what this device is, is if you wanted to uh, key one of these phones, you basically needed a computer that would generate the keys for you, more or less. And so this is, uh, it's got a serial port on the side, and you send it some simple ASCII commands, and it can read and write these keys from a desktop computer. And this was really nice, uh, because it allowed me to do was say, okay, I have some guesses about how this communication should work, and then I put a logic analyzer on it, and I said, okay, uh, does, does the pinout really work like I, I think it does? You know, do I see the address lines toggling in the way that I think they should and, and whatnot? So I was reasonably confident at this point that I had something that was at least in the ballpark. And so I took that and I said, okay, I'm going to make up a little uh, board for this. And uh, so uh, after a few weeks or whatever it takes to make circuit boards these days, maybe a few days, I don't know, uh, I said, okay, uh, I also need a uh, mechanical bit uh, to go along with this. And I said, okay, I have the solid one, but you know, the issue of that is you know, I can't actually slide a circuit board into this. So I basically took the same CAD model, but just kind of cut out a, a, a slot in the middle that would kind of you know, slide like a, a sword sheath uh, around the circuit board. And actually, the, uh, I, I printed this at the UPS store, and uh, they actually had a heck of a time with this because uh, most of the uh, support material is really blocked by all these teeth and whatnot. And so they had to soak it overnight and all this stuff, but eventually they were able to kind of give me something. Uh, but it turned out that after all of this stuff with the support material, the circuit board actually turned out to, uh, to mostly just kind of be good enough and uh, uh, to, to locate the pin, so I ended up just snapping all the teeth off. But anyways, so, so there's one of those assembled, and uh, I think I've got one of them, uh, one of these guys right here. So this is, uh, so this is one kind of my prototypes. And so the next question is, 
after we've got all this assembled. Uh, does it mechanically fit? Yes, I was able to put it in, in a fit, uh, but does it work? And so this was kind of the moment of truth, very, very excited that I was about, about to start getting to move forward with my project, and uh, no. <laughs> but, but, can we fix it? And we can. So I took the logic analyzer again, and I clipped it onto this chip, and uh, it turned out that uh, I hadn't quite looked at the, I didn't put enough test vectors uh, basically into this when I was uh, design verifying it. And I had done only a read and not a write or something like that. And there were two signals that didn't really matter for reading but were more important for writing. And it turned out I had swapped two pins. So, uh, not a big deal. I was able to swap those pins and uh, to my surprise and excitement, I was able to slot this into one of these phones and it, it actually fired up. It said, okay, you know, key recognized, I, I can read data, I can write data. And at that point, I was pretty excited because I actually managed to get an electromechanical clone that, that both fit in the phone and, and uh, correctly electrically responded. Uh, so pretty excited at that point. Uh, it wasn't as small as the, uh, the original keys were, but at least for my purposes, I was able to play with the phones. So. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the main part of the talk, but I also went on a, a bunch of like really random uh, side tangents as part of this, uh, Mr. President aside. Uh, so, so the first thing was I said, okay, I, I found a bunch of people who had these phones, and uh, they wanted to kind of collaborate, because one of the things I wanted to do was, at some point I want to get the protocol for these phones. But here's a problem. If I only have one phone, I can't, or at least not easily, I can't easily call myself and negotiate uh, communications. Uh, there's a little bit of tricks I can do with echoing things back, but it, it's pretty limited. Uh, so I want someone else that I can talk to on these phones, but nobody wants to give me one of these phones. And uh, a lot of these people had phones, but not a lot of people had keys. Once again, the keys are, are very rare. They get lost or destroyed or something. And so this PKS703 uh, is, it's, as rare or if not rarer than the keys themselves. And so I also didn't want to send this to people to program the keys. So the question is, how can I get more people who have these phones uh, actually being able to read and write the keys? Because we can clone the keys now, but we, we don't have a way to program them. And so I looked at options, and eventually what I settled on was I said, okay, I work on this project called OpenTL866. I, I like these mini pro uh, programmers. And I said, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take one of these uh, key septicles and I'm going to make a little adapter that goes from this proprietary uh, uh, you know, chip, kind of weird key form factor, back to the, uh, to like the original dip form factor of that AMD memory. So, so now if I do this, I can just put this in a standard chip programmer, and uh, it just works, just like if, this, if it's a normal uh, parallel EEPROM. And, and that solves that problem, because lots of people have these. They're very easy to get. But the next problem is those key septicles aren't very common either. Uh, the fact that I even had a few was you know, very, I don't even know where they came from, really. Uh, but, uh, so I said, okay, I need a way to get a little more creative. And so I took a bunch of uh, LEDs, I snapped off the leads, and I made some spring-loaded contacts. And it turns out if you very carefully wiggle the key into this, uh, it will actually uh, work, and you can, and it spring-loads onto the contacts. And it doesn't have that nice snap of that ugh, crypto that the other thing has. But uh, it does work. You actually can program these. So this was good, because now we have a way to both uh, replicate the keys and program them so I can get a few other people uh, joining in on the project. So the last bit, uh, or not last bit, but uh, another thing is um, I really like swag. And uh, I looked on eBay, and wow, was I excited, because I found this mug. Uh, for this phone that I've been putting a lot of work into. And I uh, got really excited and I was like, oh my, I have to have this mug. This is like the best mug ever for how many hours I've put into this project. And uh, so yeah, I, I placed an order for this mug. And um, then I was very sad when I got this email from the seller who apparently lost this mug and was unable to ship it to me. And so I started thinking, I said, okay, um, I'm already kind of in this mode of cloning things, and you know I've got a few images here of the mug. Um, <laughs> so yeah, and so <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, so now I have uh, mugs, and uh, 
Uh, actually, it's really funny. This is an enormous mug. It's half a liter. And uh, there, there were some smaller ones available, but this was the only one that was the right uh, dimensions. You know, I wanted to have the right ratios and, as the original. And, uh, other, and other mug suppliers would want to sell me like 24 minimum. So anyways, uh, <laughs> so now I have my mug. So that's great. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, because you might have noticed that uh, I also have a t-shirt. Uh, so I also, <laughs> I also went down this path and I said, okay, could we, could we also clone this t-shirt? And so this one was a little bit more outside my uh, specialty. I did some work on the mug. Uh, but uh, I found someone on Fiverr. I had never used Fiverr before. And after a little bit back and forth and a little touch up myself in Photoshop, I was also able to clone a t-shirt. Now, uh, a little bit to my disappointment, uh, if you have very nice eyes. Uh, I actually have a spelling mistake somewhere in the t-shirt, uh, which I, I failed to catch before I sent it out for fab. So if someone finds that, you know, I don't know, I'll give you a sticker or something. <laughs> uh, so, so anyway, so those are, those are the main sort of reproductions. And then uh, now with kind of the main project under wraps, you know, I have the ability to actually, uh, you know, run tests on these phones. Uh, I've actually started now to start poking at them at the protocols and whatnot. So, so what's going on with that? Uh, so the first thing is I've dumped the firmware from these phones and I've uh, popped it into uh, Ghidra. I don't know if people, have anyone here used Ghidra by chance? Does people know Ghidra? So the thing that I love about this is this is basically national security agency software reverse engineering a national security agency device. So, <laughs> so I find this at least a little bit poetic. Uh, anyways, and so there's some 8051 code in there. One of the problems with this phone though is it is a it's like a, it's like a, ca I don't know, digital catacombs. It's, it's level, it's three or four major boards, each one having uh, maybe, you know, uh, uh, two or three different, you know, CPUs and FPGAs on every board. So there's a huge amount of code to go through, you know, 8051s and Xilinx FPGAs and Motorola DSPs and, you know, every Hitachi things and everything you can imagine is inside this thing. And so one of the things that, that I have to work with is struggling to kind of piece everything together to, to kind of make this work. And so the next thing that I would like to try to do is to help triage and narrow that down is actually do some dynamic analysis on it. So what I'd like to do is actually put little clippies on a lot of the uh, parts that I think are critical, run some operations on the key, and see if I can actually get uh, some, some of the parts of the system to uh, tell me what's going on and narrow down where I need to put the effort. And then uh, I think this may be last or very close to, is that uh, what I'm also doing is, uh, although the uh, 9600, that black unit I showed earlier with, with the key, uh, I don't have a uh, way to, to have two talk together currently, I was able to get a small pile of the AT&T devices. So I've actually uh, created some uh, waveform captures from these and started to analyze these uh, to, to see if I could figure out how that protocol works. It's a little bit unclear if there's any compatibility at all between the AT&T and the uh, Motorola devices. Uh, but the first part is to actually decode this protocol. I know a little bit that it's uh, PSK uh, and a few other sort of details, but unfortunately my, on my, R, uh, my RF skills are pretty weak. So I've, I've done some preliminary analysis, but I haven't gotten too far. And uh, maybe once I get a little more free time, uh, I'll be able to go into that a little bit deeper. So anyways, uh, so that's kind of the main uh, talking points here. So thanks for listening and uh, let me know if you have any questions.